Okay, welcome back uh, on your seats. Be seated, fasten your seat belt. We're starting the next session. So for our next session, we will start with uh, a speaker from Open Cosmos. It's a company building solutions based on open source. So you could manage your, your mission from design to decommissioning. And our speaker participated in one of the first CANSAT competition here in Spain, right? Organized by Lean, that he joined later to organize the next competitions. After that, he did a young graduate training at ESTEC, where he's actually one of the tech guy behind the AstroPi. So he did some stuff that the astronauts touched, and the astronauts thanked him. <laughs> and so that was a good time over there, I think. I hope so. And today is going to talk about CANSAT and the best way to getting involved in space. And this is Daniel Sol Rollo, alias Danny. Please, Danny. Oh, you can have the microphone over there. Oh, yeah. Should I put it there? So I have some more time to talk about Danny. Sorry. Yeah. In his childhood, where he was trying to break everything. Are you okay? Coffee machine. You ready? Yeah, <laughs> almost. It dropped. <laughs> he has some yeah. stuff to show. That's that's right. going to be cool. Right? <laughs> okay, Danny, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I don't know if I should put them here. Oh, can you hear me? One, two, one, two. Yes? Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to start with a question, which is, uh, who of you think that the space is complex, it's difficult? Raise your hands. OK, almost everybody, right? OK, so yeah, I partially agree with you, especially because uh, it involves complex technology, a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork sometimes, and obviously high costs, right? And that's why uh, a bit CubeSat, the CubeSat concept and the CanSat uh, appeared around 20 years ago. Uh, both have similar purposes, I would say, which is to simplify and a bit um, enhance uh, new players and, and basically democratize a bit the, the access to space. And uh, we've seen in the last year's uh, transition, uh, the, the CubeSat, let's say, uh, standards to move into a, a more commercial uh, sector. But CANSAT still remains a bit uh, educational. And I want to talk a bit more about the, the CANSAT and put some emphasis because I think it's a very, a very interesting uh, a platform to start engaging, especially with the young ones, uh, to all this tweaking, uh, coding, and, and so on and so forth, right? A bit more hands-on. Uh, I, I, I had a look yesterday at the, the wiki, uh, at, at Kansa, the, the Wikipedia, and all these, these two images that you see over here, as we here you can see the logo of the, of the UPM. The, almost all the content there, it's, it's, it was originated a bit uh, here next, next to ESAC in, in Madrid. And it all started when uh, a few students went uh, to Tokyo around 2007. There was a workshop there. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the concept of CANSAT and, and CubeSat, they were both established around 20 years ago in the US, and then they were expanded. But in, Euro in Europe, it took a bit of time to reach. And, uh, and it, everything started uh, with an international competition that we first organized here, the first international CANSAT competition, supported by the UPM and, and the main players here. Uh, in which was basically at the university level. So a lot of universities from all around the world, uh, I remember teams from Mongolia, from Iran, from Mexico, uh, they came here in uh, 2008, and I was one of the participants. I was uh, at university, of course, and I started participating, and I started getting involved a bit into the space environment and, and a bit doing hands-on uh, projects. Right, uh, later on, uh, we've, we lost it, so the, the first international cancer competition moved to the second one in 2010, and then there was the third one in 2012. And unfortunately, the, the crisis hit it uh, as quite uh, heavily, and the, that generation of, of uh, students was not there anymore. Uh, but then the, Europe, the European Space Agency took it a bit, uh, the lead, at least at, uh, Europe-wise. And, and uh, the difference is that uh, it has been basically targeting high school, secondary school, so it's not at university level anymore. But it still proved to be a, a, 
a good, reliable, uh, I would say, simulation of a real satellite mission. It's, instead of going orbital, you go suborbital, but it still involves all the main subsystems that you have in a standard uh, satellite and uh, the main kind of project phase. So I recommend uh, you, if you want to have a look to more resources, uh, cansat.eu, I was involved then as, as I was introduced. At ESA, I was organizing the European Cansat competition. We tried to do a lot of manuals, a lot of, uh, basically distribute a lot of information, and it's uh, publicly available to start engaging the young generations towards uh, developing uh, missions or, or simulation of, of space missions. So these are a few, a few examples uh, of that. So just as a, a recap, a, a brief introduction, uh, what is a CANSAT? Uh, it has an envelope instead of a cube. It's a bit of a can size. Uh, these are the dimensions of the, the European competition. Uh, I know that in the US, uh, the dimensions are a bit bigger, uh, but the concept is pretty much the same. It's basically designing any kind of experiments, scientific uh, payload, plug it uh, in, and then just perform a mission, like normally launching a rocket, but there are other options as well. Uh, in, in general, uh, you go suborbital, so normally 1,000, 2,000 meters high uh, with a rocket, and then the cansets are ejected and they perform a mission. There are different uh, ways depending on, uh, on the competitions, but one is the comeback, so there is a mark on the floor, and whoever, uh, once it's released, whoever uh, go, gets closer to a point wins the competition. But there are, there are many ways uh, to, to compete, actually. Uh, these are some of the examples. Uh, you can see here uh, kind of a, uh, a quadcopter. So when the can the cancer was deployed, four legs were coming up with motors and then was flying around. You see here these red patches over here are wheels. So this one was landing and then with the GPS was moving around and so on. And you see a few others, like one steering, one coming down for this combat competition. And, and super innovative, uh, actually the... The interesting bit of here is that uh, everybody's willing to explore uh, new technologies and it's a kind of a friendly environment to exchange technologies and exchange all kind of uh, new concepts and to test and play around, have fun, and, and, and move on to more interesting projects. And now I'm gonna talk about the Cubican. Uh, so at Open Cosmos we developed a, a CANSAT kit, uh, which is actually what you see over here. Uh, that was done uh, like two or three, three years ago. And we took this opportunity to basically, uh, we, we basically open sourced, uh, we distributed all the resources that were, were done. I'm gonna talk a bit more about this, this cancer kit that is basically, the, the main purpose is to, to foster and, and, and promote all these kind of technologies and bring this first step that so, sometimes it's, it's difficult to do, so to have all the tools there to start uh, developing a space or simulation of a space mission. Uh, the design was done as modular as possible and using components of the shelf as affordable and as accessible and as simple as, as possible. Uh, so all the designs uh, are uh, openly available and everything was done uh, in the direction to kind of making it as compact as possible as you can see here. So uh, there was more volume uh, for payloads or for external experiments uh, to be conducted. Normally there is a primary mission that is basically transmitting pressure and temperature and then the secondary mission normally it's open to the, the young scientists or, or at university level, the NASA is still organizing it at university level together with Japan as well. Uh, so it's basically to, to use as much volume as possible to, to, to basically uh, give as much flexibility to include new technologies and, and new experiments and promote uh, science overall. These are a bit the specs of, of one of, of the kits. Uh, all this list of components, it's widely available, so anybody can just basically assemble all the components and access all these wiki pages and all the resources that, that are available online. Um, we also design uh, 3D printed uh, parts. They are also available, so everything is in a modular way. So the electronics, the, the basic electronics can be uh, basically situated in, in at any point, so in the middle or top, bottom, so depending on the, the requirements of the payload. Uh, everything can be just uh, selected in a different configuration. Um, regarding the technical specifications, so there are three, three uh, possible configurations. One is uh, the modular one. It's basically where uh, we use the, the kit to, to start soldering and uh, to start assembling the parts. And then there's a modular one that is even more and more modular. I, uh, sorry, the, the compact one that is even more compact, so uh, basically you have 80% or I would say 70% of the volume open to start plugging uh, any kind of sensor or any kind of new technologies that you want to play around with. We're using Arduino for, for as the main processing unit. 
uh, standalone Arduino Micro Pro. We went for a smaller version of it, as uh, the Arduino Uno is a bit, uh, it's a bit tight for a, a Kansat envelope. And this is a bit the integration process and how everything can be assembled and soldered together to end up with the first kind of a subsystem of a, of, of a little satellite. This is the, the compact mode that I was talking about. And yeah, as, as I mentioned, uh, the, the software used it uh, well, with basically Arduino in front of it and all the libraries basically to, to uh, program all the codes and, uh, and use it as a ground station or as, as a concept, as a satellite or as a ground station. Everything is available in different libraries and, and also in the wiki. We also developed, uh, because we, we saw that there are some nations, some, some countries, they want to, to conduct uh, CANSAT competitions, but they don't have the, the means or the resources or the, the facilities to launch a rocket because it's a bit complex. So we developed a CANSAT releaser for drones. Also, all the designs are, are also available. It's basically an attachment to, to a drone system, and then you release it whenever the countdown reaches zero, right? And that's, that's been quite uh, helpful because some, some of the countries that they would have never been able to organize a full cancer competition at national level, now they can do it with uh, standard drones, I would say. These are some examples of, of these wikis that I was mentioning. They are very educational. Uh, some effort was put in there uh, to basically gather all the libraries, all the, the designs for 3D printing, the main uh, mechanical parts, uh, for the, the modular, for the compact as well, a uh, community was created to try to engage it in a friendly way. Uh, even audiences that have no idea of uh, programming or how a uh, subsystem or how uh, a piece of code can be transmitted from one place to another. And yeah, it's been proved to be quite engaging. So and we try to support also the community. And just as a wrap up, uh, this is uh, yeah, our, our first uh, concept that we were uh, designing and, and launching uh, here next door, as I was saying, uh, one of the rockets. Uh, so it's been a transition from some of us, and this is a proof that this is the way to go, to start engaging young audiences towards doing something, something else. And uh, as you can see here, some of us here, we moved from concepts to build rockets, and then sounding balloons and rockets on top of sounding balloons to, to do raccoons. And uh, most of us are now engaged in the, in the, in the, in the space sector launching real satellites now. And uh, just one that I found yesterday, this is the concept competition, the second one that we organized. And this is a funny one because these guys over here, uh, it's most of us in our team, and the other guys over here, it's, it's the PLD. So it's a very clear example that starting uh, tweaking with all these uh, things at an early stage, it's beneficial to just move on and, and keep doing cool, uh, cool things at the end. And that's pretty much it. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So thank you for respecting the time. You have more time to talk to the crowd. That's what I like. Yeah. Let's crowd sell some questions. So does anyone have some questions? So does anyone has a CubeSat mission that lo looks like a CanSat? OK, go ahead. Hi. Maybe with a microphone. Hi, well, one question. So you said that the kit from Open Cosmos for CubeSat, uh, sorry, for CanSat is open source. And I am wondering where, which are the plans for the CubeSats Open Cosmos is developing? So which is uh, your medium term uh, plan? Right, yeah, thank you for the question. Interesting indeed. Uh, to answer this question, I would uh, also point what it was mentioned before. Uh, to have like a, a non-differentiating business. So of course we would like to release also this kind of resources for the CubeSat uh, market. Uh, we are using some of the uh, open source tools uh, available now, but uh, we are, for the CubeSat environment, uh, have it, we have released a few uh, demo payloads resources. Uh, we would like to open uh, everything and, and move on, but as, as I mentioned, for now, uh, CanSat at least, or these resources, uh, it's the first step towards probably in the, in the future, in a few months, or uh, I would like to, 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 to be even faster, right? But to release more information in that direction also for the CubeSat uh, sector, yes. All right, another question. We have some time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to play? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's uh, it's very interesting. And ex in particular, I mean, we talked uh, in this morning more about maybe software and, and during the welcome speech. Um, but now this uh, we have embedded software uh, and, and hardware projects that you open source. The question is always uh, what license uh, you choose for this? Do you have some, some ideas, some recommendations? Because this is still a bit of uh, un to say uncharted uh, waters. Yes, uh, that's a uh, just email me. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess that yeah, probably you can answer better. But uh, we've seen that there's clearly a difference uh, between software and hardware. Um, for us, always the, the difficult bit is documenting and licensing the hardware bits uh, from the software. Uh, yeah, I'm not in the core team of the software development, so I, I'm not able to answer exactly which of the licenses are we using for each of the the resources that we have released. But yeah, I just want to point out here that uh, normally it's much more difficult to document all the hardware that is involved in uh, all the resources that are available than the software-wise. There's always uh, extra effort to document hardware or, or hands-on uh, hardware physical things than the electrical, uh, or I would say like the code uh, software involved with them. And probably you can expand. Uh, yeah, well, don't make yourself broke. Don't make yourself broke. It's okay to have some things that are not open source today that will be open source tomorrow. Right. And uh, you know, if this is what it takes to be in business, that's okay. Thank you. Anyone want to react to that? Oh, cool question like, how much are you paid at Open Cosmos? Do you have free food <laughs> over there? Uh, about the free food? Um, I really, really love the, the concept of, of getting sort of youngsters engaged in, in the sort of space community. I'm wondering, with all the educational um, documentation and stuff for youngsters, do, does that include a, sort of a, also an explanation of open source and, and the philosophy behind open source? So is, is that also a thing you want to share with this project, or is it purely based on getting youngsters engaged in space specifically? Yeah, uh, good point, yes, thank you for the question. So uh, normally when you go to these national CANSAT competitions or so, you can see that the open source spirit is kind of there. Like you see all the teams sharing code, sharing tools, sharing things. So the philosophy is already there. Uh, we don't have in the resources uh, all documenting like and explaining exactly what is, what is it and so on. This comes alone and the younger the generations are, the, the more clear this is. So I would say like secondary high schools, it's amazing. Like they, they are building cancer. At some point you don't know which cancer belongs to which team, right? And, uh, and it's, it's really cool. At, at university probably gets a bit more serious and you know like a, a few. So you can see that with the age, we turn to be less open source mindset. That's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that we should uh, tackle no? and, and yeah, think about. Okay, we have a question over here. What's the question? <laughs> the eye is not ready. <laughs> yes, so um, my question is, so Open Cosmos, if I understand correctly, some of the things that you do is trying to be an, a mission developer and integrator, potentially also an operator, right? Uh, there's many in the market. I wonder what is the role of standardization so that you can actually compete Mm -hmm. in, in the rest of the, like, for example, com space or, mm -hmm. I don't know, Allen space or whatever. Right. Yes. Uh, we, we try to, to be as much pragmatic as possible uh, towards designing our tools. And we try to simplify as maximum as possible all the process of developing uh, any kind of, of payload or sending any kind of sensor or experiment to space. A clear example of, of this, it's a bit the effort that we put it in in this cubic ant that it was like at the beginning, like a few years ago. Um, but the main goal here is to develop key tools, hardware-wise and software-wise, that really support all the development in the most efficient way. I would say that's a bit in, uh, just in a, summarizing a bit uh, what we do and, and our differentiator, if you want to say, uh, with the others. And the, the software, the tool, the online platform software tool that we have, together with the hardware one, I think it's it's going in that direction of simplifying and democratizing access to space. No, C can you repeat it then? So it's one in the role of standardization. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So uh, using the CubeSat uh, standards, uh, obviously we, it is a way to simplify all this process of, of having a, a, or launching or developing any space mission. So uh, the CubeSat standards help a lot to bring everybody together and using the same standards, right, the, the dimensions. And then now we are playing with uh, changing the envelope from yeah, two, three, six, 12 units and even higher. Uh, so we are trying to follow all the main standards to try to, em to embrace uh, everybody, uh, all the technologies that uh, need access to space. So. Okay, very nice. We have uh, one more question. Or yeah, we're, done. Uh, we're done? Okay, we're done. So you can still talk to Danny afterwards. So thank you, Danny. Thank you.